Welcome back, everybody. Aaron Keller here on the Law and Crime Network. Welcome to those of you also joining us on Sirius XM Satellite Radio. Good to be back with you after a little bit of time away here from myself to visit family. We're talking about a case we've been covering for a long time here on Law and Crime, the Tex McIver murder case out of Atlanta, Georgia. The case of an attorney who was convicted by a jury of felony murder attached to an underlying aggravated assault charge. The charges surrounding the death of his CEO wife, Diane McIver, prosecutors said money was the motive, that this was a defendant who was just after money from his wife. He was an attorney, she was a CEO, but he had been transitioning out of a leadership role at his law firm. That was the motive, according to prosecutors. Just moments ago, a judge in Atlanta sentenced Tex McIver to life in prison with the possibility of parole, but due to his age, many people are saying he might not live to ever see life outside of bars again. We have a couple of guests here to join us on the Law and Crime Network to help break this down. Vincent Hill, law enforcement expert, was in the courtroom there in Atlanta. Ashley Wilcott is a trial attorney and a juvenile court judge. Ashley, Vincent, good to see you again here on Law and Crime. Thank you. Vincent, I Thanks, want to start Aaron. with you. You're down there in Atlanta, and oftentimes if you're on the ground, you pick up the vibe, you can get a sense for what's happening. What was it like when this sentencing was going down? That's right, Aaron. I'm about 30 feet away from the courtroom where this all took place, and I think Amanda Clark said it best. It's a sad day. It's a sad day for both sides, Diane MacGyver's family and friends, and of course, Tex MacGyver, his friends and family as well, because I think she put it best. This is essentially is a death sentence for Tex MacGyver, given his, given his age at this time. He's sentenced to a life in prison with the possibility of parole, but you know as well as I do, appeals can take quite a while in the court system. So we don't know the outcome. We don't know if Tex will even see those appeals before, you know, he passes away. Yeah, I mean, a lot of what ifs surrounding this case, and uh, many people will be watching this appeal very, very closely because the verdict itself, as I have said all along here, is a strange verdict. This jury acquitted the defendant of the top charge, the actual murder charge, but convicted him in what many jurors are coming out in local press reports in Atlanta saying was a compromise verdict, that some jurors saw this as a much lesser charge, basically a recklessness charge or a negligence charge, which would have resulted in only a few years in prison for the defendant. A lot of jurors really wanted that outcome. Others wanted the top charge, and they met in the middle with this felony murder charge. And ultimately, it resulted in the same punishment that the top murder charge would result in. So, Ashley, we keep hearing from jurors who not only spoke with us here on Law and Crime in a couple of instances, but who also are coming forward and speaking to the local newspaper about their deliberations and everything. Does that help or hurt the appeal to hear that so many of these jurors apparently were compromising, possibly were confused about the law? Well, I do think that can only help an appeal, right? It gives additional grounds that defense can allege. And keep in mind, juries are told in general consistently, hey, do not concern yourself with the punishment. You need to think about the actual offense and whether or not those elements have been proven. In this case, jury members have clearly said, we tried to compromise because we were concerned about the punishment. Not only that, but I have questions about whether or not the law was properly applied here. And look, I know my opinion isn't worth anything. I wasn't one of the people sitting in the chairs in that courtroom that's uh, 30 feet away from Vincent. Apparently, he measured. Um, but look, the state's whole case here was based on a financial motive that the defendant wanted his wife dead so that he could get his hands on her money, including any insurance proceeds. OK, well, the charge that the jurors convicted this particular defendant of is murder on an aggravated assault. And basically what the jury found legally is that Tex McIver intended to injure his wife. Injure, injure, injure. That's the key word. The intent was to injure under the actual conviction here and that she died as an accident, even though he really wanted to hurt her. But how does that make sense based on the state's case here? If he wanted to injure his wife, that would have increased their financial liabilities, not given him a, a crack at her assets. Uh, I, I, I can't make sense of that, that verdict, uh, Vincent. And, and I, I think that a few people were commenting on that at sentencing today, including the defendant himself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you and I were on when the, the verdict was read a, a month ago to the date, and we were all in shock. You know, the, 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 
the fact that Tex would want to injure his wife to get control of her money just never made sense because you're going to go into bigger debt when you have these medical deals. If you're dealing with someone that's in the hospital who may be quadriplegic because she was shot in the back through a seat. So it just never made sense. And I think we can all agree that I think the prosecution didn't prove his case here. Otherwise, I don't think they would have had to have gone back into that vehicle with that gun to try to recreate this crime scene that you can't recreate. And we've all said it. Yes. Now, you were there to discuss some of this with some of the folks who were present. Uh, some letters were put into evidence. You heard statements from a number of people. A number of Diane McIver's friends, though, saying, look, justice was absolutely served in this case. And they praised the court system and that jury for getting everything right. Yeah, I mean, and that's going to be, you know, a given based on the fact that they were associated, they were close to Diane MacGyver. But, you know, at the end of the day, the law is the law. We were all confused. Many of us that are experts, if you will, in the law to say, how do you get felony murder? You know, you, you couldn't even really prove the ag assault, the intent of the ag assault. So to come to a verdict of felony murder is just mind boggling to us all. Yeah, I mean, if the jury found intent then the jury probably could have found the top charge. I mean, the, the intent exactly. to injure someone who has where the defendant has a financial motive just, uh, you know, didn't make a lot of logical sense to me. But uh, that's the verdict. And the judge basically said, hey, look, um, I don't care what everybody else says. I'm sentencing according to what the jury said. But uh, Ashley, we know a number of the jurors have come forward and basically said in as many words that they almost regret that decision that they made. Right. I know that jurors here got the dynamite charge. Federally, it's the Allen charge. And about half of the states allow this, where when a jury is stuck, the judge can say, hey, look, folks, go back there and try again. Try to settle your disputes. Try to get this worked out. About half of the states allow it. It's allowed in the federal system. Half of the states absolutely don't allow it because jurors can think that that charge is an order that they have to reach some kind of a verdict. And if there's a loan holdout, or a couple of loan holdouts, then it might send a signal to those jurors that they should bend over and give in to what other people on the jury think. And the states that don't allow that dynamite charge have basically found that it is coercive, that it results in jurors caving to other jurors' opinions. Georgia allows it. In this case, it resulted in a conviction rather than a hung jury. Is this the sort of case where Tex McIver's attorneys take these juror interviews, go at an appellate court and say, these jurors were hung, they didn't want this conviction, they bent over after hours and hours and hours of deliberation and they caved because of that specific charge and they raised some kind of a constitutional defense to it. Do I think the defense attorneys are going to do that? Most likely, because let's be honest, I think they're gonna appeal on all possible grounds. That's a possible grounds of appeal. The one thing I wanna say though, is the jury have been, most of the jury members that have spoken have been very, very clear to say, all of the individuals on the jury agree to one thing, and that one thing is this man shot his wife. And so now they had to deal with the charges before them to decide, okay, can we agree on any of these charges? So I'm not as concerned with, and I know that the nation is split on whether or not states allow you to give that charge or not, but as a judge, I want to be able to give that charge because I don't want a jury to give up too quickly and say, we can't agree, we're gonna stop deliberating and we're gonna have a hung jury. I think it's not necessarily coercive. I do think that it forced this jury to look at, now that you all agree he's been shot, what's, or excuse me, that he did shoot his wife, what's next? What is the resulting conviction if there is one that's appropriate in this particular case? The problem is I think the crimes that were charged and the reading and those laws do create some contradictions that are very good grounds for appeal, quite frankly. Well, yes, I agree with you there, and uh, I can understand why there's such a split on the reading of the so-called dynamite charge, because, uh, and as you say, you know, you don't want a jury going back there talking for two hours and saying, ah, forget it, we're just going to mail it in, we can't agree, and then walk away. Here, though, the jury was deliberating for hours, days. This was a lengthy deliberation. Uh, they didn't go back there and give up very, very quickly. Uh, the issue here, uh, as I saw it, was just, okay, look, the defense admitted that 
he pulled the trigger. It was just a question of what his state of mind was when he pulled it. Was he startled awake in this process of sort of nodding off in the back seat when the vehicle came to a stop? He was kind of startled awake, and in that process, uh, he he pulled the trigger um, almost involuntarily. That sounds like negligence or recklessness. And look, I, I would agree with a conviction on those particular grounds. But did he actually intend that his wife be dead? That, uh, that was the question that they had to try to settle here. So the, the verdict just doesn't seem to match the state's theory of the case. Do you, or do you disagree, Ashley? Well, I do think, actually, that a jury, based on the theory of the case, the evidence presented, I do think they could have found that he intentionally killed his wife. They didn't find it in this case, though. So that's where there's a discrepancy and it's contradictory. Do I think they could have? I do. Uh, but they didn't do that. And they're the jury. And I respect that the jury sits and, and makes a finding based on the evidence they've heard. They could have, certainly. Uh, but it, it seems to me that it was all an all or nothing here. Either it was going to be a conviction that the jurors agreed that he wanted his wife dead or that he was reckless with the way that he had the gun in his hand, the way that it was positioned or whatnot. But, but, but the notion that he purposefully wanted to injure his wife when there was a financial motive to wanting her dead, but that that she didn't, didn't really die because he wanted her to die. He just wanted to injure her. And the one juror that we had on Law and Crime said he just wanted to control her further seemed like some backpedaling and trying to make the decision fit what the law was. I, I agree with you. I, I boil it down to this. It's just, look, I mean, some of these cases result uh, in us dissecting the law more than the facts. And this is one of those cases where the strict language of the law is absolutely crucial to trying to make the conduct make sense. And it's tough when jurors just have to listen to that law the first time around, hear it the first time around, and then try to apply it in a circumstance that's going to affect a lot of people's lives. I'm not sure that I understood all these concepts the first time I read them in my law school case books, and I'd be shocked if many people would admit that they did. It takes a, a lot of reading and understanding to try to make sense of these things. Uh, Vincent, to, you were there again just picking up some of the flavor. Um, Tex McIver talking about these letters that he got in, his, uh, in support uh, of his own case. Did people in the courtroom buy that? Did they think it was cheesy? Did they think it was cheap? What was the reaction to his statement? Yeah, well, Aaron, I, I looked around the courtroom while Tex was giving his uh, speech there, and a lot of people, especially on Diane's side, were rolling their eyes. They were disgusted. Uh, I did, for my own sake, keep time, and it was actually six minutes until he actually mentioned Diane's name when he started talking, and that really played in the courtroom. There was a gentleman sitting next to me uh, once uh, the judge said, hey, you never said, I'm sorry. He was sitting there saying, yes, I agree. He never said that, as well as a lot of people in the courtroom. But again, you know, people grieve differently. We don't know his state of mind. He did say he needed to rely on notes so that he could keep his emotions down. And he stuck to his notes. I watched him. He was flipping pages. He was flipping pages. So he definitely stuck to his notes. But it definitely played into the courtroom that the fact that, A, he didn't mention Diane for at least six minutes, and he never said he was sorry. People have different types of relationships. Maybe this one was a little bit more business and a little less emotion. It's possible that that could have been the case. Uh, Ashley, you're a judge. You practice in juvenile court. Uh, you preside, I should say, over juvenile court. You also try cases. If you were the judge presiding over this particular sentencing, would you buy this guy's argument? Would you listen to it? How would you interpret what he said? Well, I think it's really important as a judge to listen to it and apply those facts. But I'm going to say this. There also comes into play credibility, believability. Um, he has a demeanor that I think we could all agree, if you watched the trial throughout the duration of the trial, that is a little prickly, right? It's not a warm, fuzzy, you feel bad, you feel sympathetic. He didn't mean to do it. This is terrible. Instead, he can come across as a little bit more businesslike. And so I think the judge's job is to really not be biased or not influenced by too many of those things, but instead listen to what he's saying and determine, does it make sense? Is it possible? Does this all fit together? And what sentence do I therefore need to impose? And here it was a, a pretty foregone conclusion that it would be some sort of a life sentence. The possibility of parole seems rather open. 
Is there any chance this guy is going to see the light of day? Most people are saying probably not. You know, I, I disagree in that because I think there's a sympathy factor for his age based on what everybody talks about and what some of the jury members have said. So I do think it's a possibility he's going to get parole, and that may happen sooner rather than later. I think it's possible. That's an interesting observation. I'll have to do a little bit of research into the parole statutes and the parole processes in Georgia because uh, that may uh, open up another set of questions for us to analyze on our next visit. We're going to uh, dip into a break, but uh, I know, Ashley, you're going to stick around with us. Vincent, we appreciate you being with us for a little bit of color commentary from the courtroom there in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Always a pleasure.